All right, lesson number two is shop safety. And when I say shop, I'm talking uh, maintenance shop. I'm talking out in the lab using tools and aircraft parts is what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. So why do we care about safety? Uh, well, you don't have to write this one down. But I am in some part responsible for whether or not you get damaged and I send you home in more pieces than you came in. Most of you show up in, in one piece, and I don't want to have to send you home with, like, like here's Mauricio, and here's his, his index finger off of his left hand in this little box over here. I, I really don't want that to occur. I really don't, don't want that to occur. So I have a personal motivation, uh, but maybe for you, you don't want to die or get some disease or lose a finger. Has anybody ever gotten a disease? I'm the only one? Okay. Uh, but you can get diseases like from ingesting chemicals. It can cause cancer. It can cause liver failure. It can cause blindness. Uh, you can have uh, bladder. Well, I, never mind. In any case, there are some chemicals that it's really a, not a good idea for them to either be breathed by you or to be soaked in through your skin or to drink or get to get in your eye. So we don't want this physical damage up to including death. Has anybody ever died from an industrial accident? Yeah, not in this life anyway. Okay. All right. Uh, if you don't get hurt, you could keep your working. You know, of course, I'm writing this based on, I guess you could cross out working and keep going to school. But then some of you would say, well, ha, 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 sweet. If I get hurt in the shop, then I don't have to go to school. So, so, don't, write, so don't write that down. Don't write that I can get out of school if I get hurt in shop. Um, if you have a pilot certificate, you may want to keep your pilot certificate. Uh, what happens if you get an eye poked out or uh, an arm chopped off? Has anybody ever had an eye poked out, an arm chopped off? I'm, I'm the only one that's had either of those two. Okay. Eye, eye transplants are very expensive. It takes a lot of years for the FAA to finally uh, give you your medical certificate back. How about, uh, here's, a, here's a thought. If you go to work for a major airline as a mechanic, they're going to give you a physical exam. They're going to tell you what doctor to go to, or you're going to go to their doctor, and they're going to give you a physical exam. It's not because they do it. wrong with you that they think you will hurt yourself or hurt, hurt others. So for instance, if you don't have vision in one, you might your safety hat is walking along inside the hangar you can't see out of one eye. So if you so people go, I don't have a medical certificate, I'm a mechanic. You may recall from yesterday that I said anything about mechanics needing a medical certificate. It's because mechanics don't have to pass an FAA medical. But you might have to pass an employment physical. And if you want to make a lot of money, the airlines is the place to do it. And, of course, there are federal laws, and we're going to cover that, a little bit of that before today is over. There are actually federal laws governing uh, safety of employees. And so we're going to comply, even though you're not an employee. We're, I'm going to have you comply with the Occupational Safety and Health Administration guidelines of the federal government so that you get used to doing that. Because someday you'll be a supervisor of airplane mechanics, and now it will be your fault if you don't make your employees follow the rules. And they are, there are actually federal laws about it. And, of course, it's just nice. I, I remember when, when I lost my eye, I, was going, I went to a, a 3D movie. It was in New Orleans. And I went up to, the, to buy the ticket. And of course, I had my eye patch on. And I asked the person selling the tickets, and I said, hey, I've only got one eye, you know, and they're selling you the glasses, the 3D glasses. Can I just pay half price? I swear it is true that I did, in fact, ask the person selling. I did wear an eye patch, and I did ask them if I could get half price, and they said no. I'm sorry, sir. Well, they only have one price on the ticket. that doesn't say if. And I wasn't under 12 or something like that. So I went in and saw the movie. Do you think I could see in 3D with only one eye? No, you can't see 3D if with one eye. Try that sometime. It's, you can't see. Close one eye. That's like you try to put your fingers together. Oops. 
Yeah, it's a lot. It's hard. Yeah, well, your arms are. The, yeah, try doing it sideways like this. That makes it a lot harder. I've been practicing because I lived without vision in one eye for five years. I lived without uh, without depth perception. But it's nice. And, and ten fingers. You know, what if you lost? What if you lost your middle finger? That would be rough, wouldn't it? You could never communicate as accurately to other drivers in cars as you would like. Maybe that's just me. All right, so we're going to talk about uh, things that can go wrong. And on the test, I'm going to say, like, uh, what are the hazards and prevention techniques to prevent from losing your eyesight? And you're going to tell me some things that could go, that some hazards, things that could cause a problem with your eye, and what are the things you could do to prevent it. So, oh, wait, there's eyesight. So you'll notice there's two major hazards to your eyesight. One of them is getting poked in the eye. If you'd rather say I get poked in the eye instead of writing a puncture, that's okay. Has anybody ever been poked in the eye? Am I the only person that's ever been poked in the eye? Isn't there an old saying, it's always fun until somebody gets their eye poked out? Is that, a, is that a famous saying? Okay, I wonder who said that first. All right, you can also get chemicals in it and scar your eye or kill your eye. So both of these things are a problem. The puncture or getting your eye poked is the, this is actually the most likely, other than walking into an airplane, it is the most likely damage to occur to you doing aircraft maintenance. So what we're going to do is, number one, on the prevention, when we go out in the shop, you're going to get your clipboard, you're going to grab your safety goggles, and you're going to put your safety goggles on. So am I. And we're going to wear, when we're in the shop, in lab, we're all going to wear safety goggles all the time. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying wearing safety goggles is fun, but I am saying that you're going to leave with both of your eyes intact by the end of the semester, whether you like it or not. Well, Mr. Johnson, I don't care if I lose one eye. What's the big deal? And I can say, well, I don't want to have to tell, tell Fabrizio Lofaro that I let you get your eye poked out. Well, yeah, they were playing fake swords in the shop, and one of them didn't have their safety goggles on, and I knew it, but I didn't tell them to put it on, and the other kid poked his eye out and fell out right on the floor. And I'm not going to tell that to Fabrizio. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say they were playing swords in the shop, but they had their goggles on, so they got a big slash through their cheek, and it came out the other side. But you can sew that up, and you get a nice scar, and you have a good story about how you were playing, you know, you shot yourself, you, you know, you were, you were in the Iraqi war or something. But at least you still have your eyeball. Scars don't bother me too much. The eyeballs, I really like the eyeballs. So the other prevention to uh, punctures and chemicals to your eye, in addition to using goggles, is, follow, is using tools correctly. And you don't have to write this part down, but generally speaking, if tools are supposed to be sharp, you're more likely to hurt yourself if they're not sharp because they're, they're dull, get stuck, and then they give way when you're not expecting, and now that sharp tool goes somewhere that you weren't expecting. Same thing for like a drill bit, a good sharp drill bit. You can predict what's going to happen. And thing, and, but if it isn't dull, and if it's dull and it sticks and that piece of metal spins around and goes flying and something gets you in the eye, it's maybe because the drill bit was dull. So there are some techniques that we might follow, and don't worry, I will tell you, to help prevent getting your eye poked out by using tools. Now, this is the only one of it. We've got three or four slides like this, but there are two basic types of goggles. One of them is the goggles that we're going to wear. And they're designed, they go, up, uh, they go up above the top, and they go down a little bit, and they go on the sides. And they're there for things that are flying objects to not get you in the eye. That's why I wear goggles on top of my glasses, because things can get come in the top and in the bottom and then the sides. Uh, back when I used to teach all the time, students would ask me, but when I was wearing an eye patch uh, and didn't have an eye transplant, uh, students would me what you know after a few weeks into the semester hey mr johnson you know if do you, would you mind if i ask you what happened to your eye and so of course i would tell him and uh, i was packing it's about three 
happen in there? So, uh, and somebody ahead of me went through a big branch that was sticking out, and they let go of it, and it was about yay high. And I was looking down at the ground, and it came, the branch came like this, but there was a little piece about an inch and a half long sticking out. And I was looking down, and it came right in across the top of my glasses and went through my eyelid. Can you see that scar on my eyelid? In any case, it came through the eyelid, and it punctured my eyeball. Sorry, I didn't mean yeah, so they, they put a bandage on me, and we turned around and we hiked out. But three days later, we get to the hospital. You know, my eyes turned gangrene, so they had to amputate it. They couldn't save the eyeball. So I, uh, at, at, after it healed up, they gave me an, a glass eye to put in there. But it was a little bit too small. And every now and then, about once a week, it would fall out, which was kind of a pain. So one day it fell out, and it was on the cement, and it broke. So... Uh, so I went in, and they gave me a slightly bigger one, and this time it, it was a little bit too big because it's like, um, like uh, what do you call it, contact lenses. You need to take them out every day and clean them. So to, to get, it didn't want to come out, didn't come out. So every now and then, I actually have to take a spoon to get it out, and it's like, forget that. Forget, I don't, if i got to use a spoon to get my glass eye out, forget it. But then I had this big gaping hole in my head, and that people see that, and they, that's kind of freaky, right? And so I, I literally started spray. I started wearing an eye patch over my glasses, but the thing would pop off. So I actually spray painted the inside of my lens. And, and what I really hated, I got my glasses at cost, and they charged me if I didn't have this ground. And I add, well, can't I get half price at least on the lenses? No, I'm sorry, sir. We only have one price, even if we don't grind it. Down. It's like. You know, that was one of the first, that was maybe the first time where I tried to get a discount. And they said no. I mean, what's up with this world? In any case, so I wore the eye patch. It literally, uh, my lens was painted. So that's when students would ask me what happened. Pardon me? It was, it was almost, it was almost five years after I lost my eye. Uh, and they found somebody, they never would tell me his name, you know, because they don't want you to go look him up and, but his name was George. This is what I mean. His name was George, and he was terminally ill from some disease, but they wouldn't tell me. And he was very kind, and he decided to donate one of his eyes before he died. So that was awesome. I wrote him a nice letter. I mean, I suppose he got it. I didn't get a response. Pardon me? Yeah, they took it out before. That's what was cool. He volunteered to... I, I don't know how the transplant system there worked, but I got on the list, and then... They said, oh, well, here's this guy, and he's on, he's on the donor list because he's terminally ill. And uh, we asked if he would be willing to donate it before he died. He said, yes. Yeah. like, sweet. So that means we could schedule it. It's not like I got a phone call at 4 in the morning and say, hey, somebody died and they got an eyeball for you. So we got to schedule it, you know, on a regular day. So that was pretty cool. So, there, so the kind of goggles that we're going to use in class are mechanical goggles, and they're designed for flying objects to hit the goggles and fall off. And like I said, they come up a little over the top and a little under the bottom and the sides. Are there. And so one of the things we're, we're going to end up at some point is we're going to cut uh, stainless steel safety wire. It's really thin stuff, and where you cut it with the wire cutters, it's really sharp. It's really sharp. And sometimes you cut off a little piece, and it goes bing, and it goes flying out at 25 miles an hour. And it may not be into your eye, but it will be into somebody else's eye. So that's a good reason why we're going to have mecha wear mechanical goggles. Splash goggles are similar, except that the splash goggles actually seal around your skin all the way around. And sometimes they, they cover your full face. So that's if you're using chemicals that are really bad for your eyes. just going to be using the mechanical goggles, but there are times as an aircraft mechanic that you might be using a big, a big bucket of chemicals and you would wear splash goggles, and that effectively, it, they're not like watertight like you can go scuba diving with them, but they're pretty close. All right, another thing that can be impacted is your hearing, and there are two more, likely two things as an aircraft mechanic that could negatively impact your hearing power tools. Now, we're not going to use much in the way of power tools 
for a long enough period of time to do things. But if you're, you, you will probably hear this semester, especially if you come in early out in the lab. Maybe you heard it last semester. They're doing, they're doing drilling, and those drill motors, think about how loud it is if that drill motor is only two feet from your ear, not 50 or 75 feet across the hangar. That thing's loud. I recommend if you're going to use a drill motor for more than 30 seconds, you put in hearing earplugs. What we are going to do is we're going to run engines. One of the things we're going to do in lab is we're going to uh, remove spark plugs. We're going to clean them. We're going to gap them. We're going to test them. We're going to reinstall them. And then we're going to make sure that the electricity going to the spark plugs happens at the right time. So it's called ignition timing. I won't go into detail, but we have to adjust it. And then we get to run the engine. So there, there are engines out there. There, there are 200 cubic inches, and they put out 100 horsepower at sea level, and we're going to set the timing on them, and then we're going to take them out, and we're going to run them. Yay! Make noise. We're going to convert hydrocarbon-based fuel into thrust and noise and heat. That, so we are definitely going to wear ear, ear, earplugs, and I will provide each of you with one set of earplugs. That just like your goggles, at the end of the day, you will put in your little cubby hole, and so that the next day you still have earplugs. You could also wear headsets. There was this one time in band camp. Where, okay, two and a half smile. Thanks. Oh, there's a, there's a half a smile. Uh, I actually have never been to band camp, but I did see this movie one time. Uh, in any case, uh, where I was running a very small jet engine, the intake. And had certain type of blades in that turbine engine that were ridiculously loud. And I had foam earplugs in, and my head was about three feet from the intake, and my ears hurt from the noise. So after that, when I ran that engine, I put in the earplugs, and then I put the headsets on. Before that, many, many years ago, when I was in the service, I was flying on the, er, the second to the last model of B-52, the G model, it had turbo jets, which are noisier than turbo jets. Actually wore earplugs, and then we put our headsets on. And then we had to, to get through the earplugs. We had to turn the intercom volume all the way because it was loud. So you know it's loud when you're wearing earplugs and you're wearing headsets. Limbs. When I limbs, I'm talking about feet and arms and hands and legs and whatever sticks out. Use your imagination. So the basic, ha the basic, ha like your ear or your nose. Technically, those aren't limbs. Those are appendages. I, I took anatomy physiology in high school in, 19 seven in the 1976-1977 school year. Does anybody remember 1976-1977? Mr. Loftus was my high school anatomy physiology teacher. I took anatomy physiology because the last auto shop was closed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Are they still? Okay, you didn't, you have, did you go to the Church of Christ in Dinuba? <laughs> are you serious? That's where I went to church when I was a kid. Yeah, their son Keith is my age. And so Keith is like 57, and he was one of the middle kids. So his parents are probably 25 or 30 years older than that. So they're probably eight in their 80s. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, one of their, uh, Joanne's, Mrs. Loftus's, uh, let's see, there were Cheryl and Terry, and then Keith, and then they had two more daughters younger. But they were little kids. I didn't care about them. Yeah, I went to the church. I'll be dogged. Yeah, yeah, Joanne Loftus. In any case, um, why did I get off on that? So sharp tools can poke you. Power tools can poke you or cut you, and they can cut fingers off. That's, that's always not fun. The heavy objects can fall down and squish your feet. Anybody ever dropped anything on your foot? Bad enough that your toenail turned color? Bad enough that your toenail fell off in six months? I've done that on more than one occasion. I was actually building a metal stand for a jet engine, and I had the jet engine on, and the engine weighed like a thousand pounds. And nor and most of the stands I made were like wheels, 
except longer. But this engine was so heavy, I put an extra in the middle, and I was pulling it, and I rolled the wheel right smack over my foot. I was wearing, it didn't hurt. It didn't, no, I went, no, I was wearing tennis shoes. And it's like, wow, I'm glad that didn't hurt. Must not have got me that bad. I figured, all right, sweet. I noticed it before I got hurt. But uh, sure enough, in a few weeks, I started noticing the toenail was grown out, and it was grown out really dark purple. And after about six months, the toenail fell off. It grew back. But, well, it grows back, but now it's like, and now it looks like a claw. Ouch. Ouch. Uh, so you can drop stuff. And then, of course, the most likely way for you to die this semester is by getting your head hit with a propeller that is spinning. So I'm going to say that again. The most likely way for you to die this semester in A&P school is an uh, engine is running and your head gets hit by the propeller. And I'm saying this two or three times because that is one of the things that I'm going to be really strict about because I really, really, really don't want you to get your head hit with a propeller. Now, if that propeller hits you in the arm and it breaks your arm, it's going to hurt. And they'll probably be able to put your arm back together again. And they'll probably work almost as good as they used to. But if the propeller hits your head, you die. And the propellers are made of solid aluminum. Think, take a baseball bat. An aluminum baseball bat. They're, are they hollow? They're hollow, right? Okay, fill it full of aluminum. Now stick it in a vise and squish it so it's kind of flat like a sword. Not sharp, but flat. And then somebody takes that baseball bat and swings it as hard and as fast as they could. And right at the end, they don't hit you with the flat part. They hit you with the bent part in like that. And pretend that they're swinging it around four times faster than that. Very large baseball player that weighs 220 pounds that that uh, gets a lot of home runs, but they're swinging it four times faster than being a home run. You're going to die. So just to be clear here, I am going to be very strict about helping make sure that that doesn't happen. So when we get to the place where we're going to be working on airplane engines with these aluminum propellers that have leading edges, it's not like it's sharp. You. If this thing's spinning around 2,000 RPM, it'll cut in half. So this leading edge, this is made out of wood. Just that open too. But the aluminum one will do a little, a little bit because this wood will crack. All the all the impact force will go against your skull. So when we get to that point when we're going to start working on the engines and we're going to be moving that propeller around, I'm going to be teaching you some techniques to prevent you from dying. So how can you prevent getting poked, cut off, dropped on, or get your head propped out? Well, if it's a particular if it's power tools, but if it's sharp tools, how do you use that tool correctly? There are some times when you want to use gloves. Uh, there's a downside. If you're using a power tool and that glove gets pulled in by the blade, is that better or worse than if you weren't wearing the glove? Why is it worse? Yeah, because the, the fabric of the glove could get caught in the blades and literally pull your hand in when you're trying to pull it out and make it worse. So most power tools, it's better if you don't wear gloves. It's better to cut your skin and have it rip and you be able to pull your hand back than for it to start cutting the glove and grab the glove and pull your hand into it, and now it cuts your whole finger off. Has anybody ever had their finger cut off? I've never had a finger cut off. All right. Um, but if you're using like a knife or a chisel, a glove is all right. If it's not a power tool... But it's sharp. Sometimes a glove is better. There are guards, things to put in the way between you and the power tool and where we use the grinders. And I'm going to show you how to put a guard in place so it's less likely for things to go flying and hit you in the eyes. Uh, if we were going to be around a lot of heavy things that we might drop, in particular metal things, we might wear steel-toed shoes, but we don't, aren't going to be doing that, so we aren't going to wear steel-toed shoes. 
And then the habit patterns, I'm particularly referring, specifically referring to how not to get your head chopped off by an airplane propeller. There's this one place where a guy got his head hit and he almost died, very luckily. And so everybody in the shop after that, they started wearing uh, bicycle and motorcycle helmets when they were work, work around the propeller. Because so, this was not just like some brand new kid right out of mechanic school. This is an experienced person. So I'm, I'm not saying you have to go that far, but... All right. Just to be clear here, we're talking about unintentional poisoning. If I want to poison you intentionally, you will never know. You'll just come back to school, and everybody will be going, Mr. Johnson, how come Jonathan doesn't come to class anymore? Oh, his mom called me, told, told me that he was poisoned, and they can't explain it. He doesn't show, show up in the blood test. Just like on that uh, CSI Las Vegas, Season 4, Episode 7. <laughs> oh, sorry. You think I'm kidding. You just look that up. Season 4, Episode 7. Huh? Yeah, but if but nobody but how many how many CSI departments you think the city of Fresno is as good as Las Vegas is on television? They're like, oh, he's he's dead. Oh darn! I'm sure they have some blood tests, but the CSI in Las Vegas on TV, they can test for twenty seven thousand different drugs, different poisons. Fresno County, they can probably test for seven. So you just got to know which seven they are. <laughs> Sorry. Unless you go over to Danuba or Orosi and you're in Tulare County. See, I don't know. What, what, is the, what is the crime scene investigation system in Tulare County? Is anybody familiar with the kind of poisons they check for? Huh? They just, oh, he died of poisoning. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, so there's, four, there's at least four ways to get poisoned. At least four ways. Maybe there's more. Well, I get, like I said, this is unintentional poisoning. You know, if it was intentional, it could be somebody gave you a shot or somebody slipped you a Mickey or, uh, you know, somebody put some, dr some poison on your socks and you pulled your socks on. I know you're having a good time writing all that down. I don't want to interrupt you. I mean, I do want to, but I'm not going to. Where, what, oh, does anybody ever see that, that CSI Miami? You know, the guy with the red hair? He wears a sunglass and he's always cocked his head sideways when he talks and says something real serious. Yeah, Horatio, that's his character's name. What's the actor's name? I can't think of his name. In any case, don't worry about it. In any case, there was an episode. I'm not making this up. I don't know if it's a good idea. Here, I'll turn No, it's bad when your instructor's recording a lecture and he has to turn the microphone off. Uh, so let's talk about these four kinds of hazards. If you, you can get chemicals on your skin, and we don't think about it a lot, but chemicals can be absorbed through your skin and get into your body, into your bloodstream. Your skin can do that. So if there's chemicals that are bad for you, we're going to put them in gloves so they don't get through your skin. Like later this semester, we're going to do a fiberglass project. And partially, it's really messy and it sticks to your skin, but partially that epoxy resin is not really good. It's really good and sticky. Epoxy resin will go into your skin. It's not terribly bad for you, but we're going to prevent doing that. Uh, inhalation of particles. So that's different than inhalation of gases. Particles, uh, like if you're sawing wood, you get sawdust and some of it flies up. The nice thing about sawdust is it's not very hazardous. Unless it's treated wood, and then there might be chemicals in it. Um, inhalation of gases. And when I'm saying gases, I'm also talking about uh, liquid uh, vapor. Well, I guess liquid and vapors are two different things. But there are chemicals that evaporate. Like if you pour out uh, 
of rubbing alcohol on the sink in your bathroom, you can smell it, right? It's because the liquid evaporated into a gas, and now you're breathing a gaseous state of alcohol. Well, a little bit of isopropyl alcohol is not too bad for you. But what if you closed all the windows and taped up the inside of your bathroom? Remember, we're talking CSI now. And you tape up all all the cracks and all the windows, and you... You sat there for an hour. Yeah, okay. And this is something that's in some of your house probably, right? And does anybody ever tell you, oh, you're going to use isopropyl alcohol on that wound. Oh, you better put on a chemical gas mask. No, and nobody ever says that because you're not going to inhale very much of it. Although I'll bet you $10 if you read the, the instructions, it says use in a well-ventilated area like your bathroom with all the windows taped up. Um, this semester, we're not going to be using a strong enough chemical in a high enough concentration that we have to use a mask. But we're, I'm not talking about masks that, uh, that, you know, the kind you use to mow the lawn. All it does is keep out particles so you don't sneeze too much if you have a little bit of uh, allergies. But there are masks that seal around your nose and your mouth, and it actually pulls the air through a filter that can actually filter out isopropyl alcohol or other kinds of fumes. I'll show you one in the lab before the semester's over, but we're not going to use any chemicals that are that dangerous for us to have to do that. And then, of course, your personal favorite. Yes, Brandon. You can breathe in radioactive materials. So to answer your question, your basic answer is yes. Yeah. For instance, if there is a nuclear explosion, and you want to kill the greatest number of people, you want the bomb to go all the way down and not explode until it gets to the ground. Blow it up. Think about the hundreds of yards, this big giant crater that's, a, that's, that's 500 yards in diameter or more. Think of all that dirt. It goes up into the air, and it's radioactive. When that dirt falls on you, it's radioactive, and it radiates you, and it can start causing cancer. You're also going to breathe it in, these radioactive particles. Now, the likelihood of you getting lung cancer goes through the roof. So you're breathing in a, a molecule that is radioactive. So, yes, you can breathe things that are radioactive. You know what? I can't tell you how small those particles are. I don't know. When I was in the service and we practiced NBC, it was nuclear, biological, and chemical, it was the same suit. And it was this plastic rubberized suit that when you breathe in, everything went through super deluxe filters. And so whether it was nuclear material or it was biological viruses and stuff or whether it was chemical or something, uh, you didn't get any of it. But you sweated like a horse because there was no airflow. Think about trying to fly, drive a car in that thing. Oh, wait, think about trying to fly an airplane. Uh, uh, I hated NBC training. Oh, man, when the schedule came up and it said NBC training, you were just like, okay, can I get sick and not have to go to do that? Then, because if you missed it, they made you come back the next week and do it. So you just, yeah. It, huh? No, well, you had, to, you had to do the training. You had to do the training every two or three years. I can't remember. Is there another question? Okay. All right, so ingestion. So this is one reason why when we're in lab, no, no drinks in lab. The only, the only exception to that is on, on Fridays. The only things we're going to have on Fridays is, is, is a little bit of glue, which you'd have to drink the whole bottle before you got sick, and I think that won't happen. But on the other four days of the week, Monday through Thursday, when we're in lab, not only is there no eating in lab, there's no drinking in lab. So we'll find it. if you got some water, you can stick it on there, and there's a water faucet. On your break, you can drink whatever you drink. That's fine. Back from break, you can't bring your glass of soda or whatever it is and set it down next to where you're working. Because I want to have 0% chance that you get or cleaning food down in there. When you go to work for a shop, the supervisor says do whatever the hell you want. 
ingest all the poisonous chemicals you want. I don't mind. I mean, if you called me up and told me, I would be sad for you. But I won't know, so I probably won't mind. But while you're here, that's what we're going to do. So, uh, so to prevent these things from happening, you can wear gloves. And when we do the fiberglass stuff, we're going to wear gloves. We probably, I'm trying to think if we do anything to where we have to wear the dust. Oh, yeah, we're going to use the dust masks because we're going to make a fiberglass project, and then we're going to run it on the belt sander and all these little tiny pieces of fiberglass, and, the, and that's not good to breathe. It gets in your lungs, and it's bad for your lungs. So we're going to wear some dust masks. Uh, we're not going to use enough chemical, bad enough chemicals to use chemical breathing masks. And like I said earlier, we're not going to use enough chemicals in a big enough quantity that if it got in your eyes, that it would be that big of a deal. So we're not going to wear splash goggles. But that's what you could do. And I'm not, just to be clear, I'm not trying to tell you all this stuff to scare you and go, oh, I don't want to go and shop. I just want to scare you enough that when we are in shop, You'll follow these safety precautions, and then you're much, much, much less likely to die or be injured than you would otherwise. On the test, I'm going to ask you a question, and it's going to go like this. MSDS is an abbreviation for five words, and you're only going to write four on the test, and then you're all going to get one wrong. I'm just kidding. I'll say what four words do MSDS stand for. MSDS, and we're going to practice this in lab. MSDS is an abbreviation for Material Safety Data Sheet. I'll let you write that down, and I'll talk a little bit about it. And this will be our last slide of the day. Not that you have to put your pencil down, because you might still have to take some notes. But we went three minutes over yesterday, so we're going to go four minutes over today. Oh, wait, the best way to do it is if you stay late, you have to come early the next day. Sorry, I forgot about that. Thanks, Josh. I appreciate that. So these four things here are what's on a material safety data sheet. A material safety data sheet is a piece of paper or several pieces of paper, or it could be an electronic version. And effectively, it's similar to... What's on the back of that bottle of isopropyl? On the back of that isopropyl alcohol, it'll say directions and it'll say precautions like don't get too much on your skin, use in a well ventilated area. Well, that is being sold for consumer use in small quantities, and there's an expectation that you're going to only do it, use it every now and then. So it's arguable that it's not very dangerous. But if you were going to buy a gallon of isopropyl alcohol and bring it into the workplace and being in a business, in an office, technically, according to federal law, I have to give you access and tell you to read isopropyl alcohol. And in just those directions, it's got a whole bunch of stuff on it. Four things that care about, and we're going to practice this a couple of times on one of our lab, on a couple of our labs. You're going to want to know how does this get into my body? Do I have? Do it, can it sink through my skin? Am I going to breathe it because it evaporates easy? If I drink it, is that bad? What's if I splash it in my eyes? So it's going to tell you how does it get into you. It's going to give you the preventive measures, which I think is the most important part. Is what? How? What do I have to do about it? Do I need to put on gloves? Do I need to put on mechanical goggles, or do I need to put on splash goggles? And then symptoms of exposure. It'll tell you what if you get exposed, does it make you get a headache? Does it make you feel tired? Does it make you pass out? Does it give you a buzz? And then, and then it'll tell you what to do in case you get exposed. First aid treatment. Do you, splat, do you go to the eye wash station and wash your eyes out? Do you drink lots of water? Do you drink milk? Do you make somebody throw up if they ingested it? Or do you not make somebody throw up if they've injected, like acid? Your stomach can handle acid, so usually if you drink acid, you don't want the acid to ruin your esophagus coming back up the second time. So usually acids, they say go to the hospital and they'll pump your stomach. Don't make them throw up. So we're going to cover that. Uh, we're going to practice this a couple of times, a material safety data sheet, so that 
Sunday, and here's what's really funny. Technically, the last job I had before I came back to teaching in college, I was an office worker. I was a director of aviation, and 99% of my time I was in an office building. And I wasn't out on the shop, and I wasn't out flying a machine. And technically, you know that little bottle that's got the white you have to have, according to the, the OSHA, federal law, you have to have a material safety data sheet for a bottle of whiteout somewhere at your company where employees had access to it because it had, like, alcohol or something stupid in it. So you could read it and say, do not drink it. It didn't say anywhere on there that you would get a buzz drinking it, so I never drank it. Does anybody have any questions about material safety data sheets? All right. Uh, there are more than one person who still needs to bring in a textbook. There's one person in this room that needs to bring in a textbook. I'll see you all tomorrow.